I know that many of us have already been baptized, and so it might seem that this particular topic might not be very relevant, but I think that when we speak about baptism, when we look at what baptism symbolizes and, and how it's spoken about in scripture, we see that there are certain principles that are true in our life, even if we have already been baptized. And particularly, if you are a person, a young person here today, tonight, who has been considering baptism and, you know, the way that our church does baptism, very many churches do this where you'll take baptism classes up until baptism. And the purpose here is to educate you, help you understand what baptism is so that when you reach the time right before baptism, you can really be sure that this is what you want to do. And so prior to signing up, maybe people have some kind of misgivings of, I don't even know if I want to sign up because I know that little about it. So I think that it is warranted for us to look at it very um, from a really high up view as what it's about so that if you are considering making this decision, and it's a very good decision, it's a very good act to take, um, I hope that this will be of benefit to you in making that choice. I also want to emphasize that what I'm speaking about today, it's not so that you get baptized specifically with our church. That's not the case. It's that when you come to that moment to make that decision that you just fully understand what it is that you're doing and with whichever church you choose to do that, um, that, that it will make sense to you for why you're doing it there and why you're doing it at all. So to start, there were some questions that I had when I was thinking about baptism that I don't think I ever really asked myself until I started writing this message. And the first one was, what does baptism mean in the sense of just the word itself? Because we know that part of the Old, uh, part of the Bibles are in, in Hebrew, and then another part of it was written in Greek and Aramaic, I believe. And so because of that, those words in those old languages are translated into our modern day language, and that's why we have so many different translations of the Bible. It's different scholars, different groups of people taking these old words and saying, what's the closest equivalent to how we speak now for us to be able to understand what those old texts used to mean? So even though it can get a little confusing, it's a really great benefit to us to take the time and look at the root of the word that we use and to understand where it came from and what it means. And so I learned just recently that baptism is from the Greek word baptismo, which means to immerse, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because when people get baptized, they get immersed in water and then they, and they get dunked. Or some, I've heard some people call it like that. Let's get dunked. That's how they <laughs> refer to baptism. But whether you're being dunked, whether you're being baptized, the point here is that you're being immersed. And that's a very, um, it's a very interesting word to use because immersion means in our English language that you're fully covered, that you're completely covered in whatever it is that you have been immersed into. If it's water, if it's lava, if it's chocolate, whatever it is, the point is that it's completely covered you. And that is really important to the symbolic act of baptism, that you are fully covered. Another question that I thought to myself was that in Matthew and in John, where it writes about John the Baptist baptizing, it says that he, ha his, he said himself, I do a baptism of repentance. And I got stuck on that because I thought, how was it that John was baptizing a baptism of repentance when Jesus had not yet come? Our understanding correctly is that we need Jesus to be able to fully repent. So what was John doing? And, what I, and, and how was he able to do this if Jesus had not yet died? And so what was this repentance he was baptizing in? And John's baptism of repentance, it represented a willingness to repent, which means to turn from your old ways and to be cleansed. But the key difference here was that it could not keep people clean. That is why he said, right after he says that I do a baptism of repentance, he says, but there is one greater than I who will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. So John says, my baptism is of repentance because you as the Jewish people, as the Gentiles, want to change, want to turn away from the way you are living. You want to repent. You want to be clean. But my baptism is not enough to keep you clean. And so there is still one. Jesus, who is coming, whose act will be the thing that is able to keep you clean. 
John's baptism prepared people for the coming of Christ. Water, as it's used in scripture, symbolizes a lot of different things, and one of those is cleanliness. And so in the same way that people would prepare themselves for a king who's going to visit their home, by being baptized, by allowing John to baptize them, those same people at that time were in a sense cleaning themselves in preparation of a coming king. And that coming king in their understanding was the Messiah. And as we know, that Messiah was Jesus. The other thing to understand about John's baptism was that baptism was a common practice in John's time, in the time of the Bible, but it was primarily used for Gentiles to convert to Judaism, for Gentiles to become Jews. Gentiles were people who were not Jews, so it was all of the surrounding nations that were among the Jewish nation. And so for John to call Jewish people to repentance through a baptism, which was a practice that Gentiles did, it was a really radical movement. Because one of the things that we also understand from history and scripture is that there was tension between Gentiles and Jewish people. They were considered, the Gentiles were considered unclean. So for the Jewish people to participate in a water baptism meant that they were identifying with something that Gentiles were doing. And that was a really big deal. So all those things considered, that's kind of the first mention of baptism as well in scripture is what John was doing for the Jewish people. And his cry, he was this voice that was calling out that one is greater, who one who is greater is coming after me. With all that said, I wanted to hit on three key points about the process of baptism and kind of what it results in in our life and why we ought to choose to be baptized. The first thing that is really critical about baptism is that it's a choice that you make on your own for yourself as a thing, as a next step, so to speak, in your relationship with God. And to get there, there's something that has to happen. There's truly, in my opinion, and from what I understand in scripture, only one real prerequisite, one real first step to being baptized, and that is we have to die to sin. So the first thing we're going to talk about that happens with baptism is that we are dead to sin. And looking at Romans 6, verse 2 to 3, we read the following. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? So there's a really key part about baptism. It's this, I guess you could call it that first motion. You're in the water past the pastor standing next to you. You say that I promise, you, you go through the three things that you promise. And then when you're being immersed, baptized, you go completely under. And this act of going completely under is symbolic of death, of you know, going down into the grave, of you're being covered and you're going down. And that is a really important symbolism because of what Paul is writing about here in Romans. And I really recommend reading Romans 6. It talks, it talks a lot about be, dying to sin and what baptism symbolizes. But what does it mean for us to die to sin? I'm going to go to the super, super basics. Sin is disobedience to God and God's will. The original sin in the garden was the result of Adam and Eve's decision to disobey God's command. Subsequently, after that, all humanity that followed and us, our disobedience to God, our sin separates us from him. And the consequences of sin is death. And when I wrote down that note, I was like, but why? <laughs> why death? Why, why do you die? Why are the wages of sin death? What, why is it exactly that there, there's such a almost harsh and hard kind of result of sin. And maybe, you know, you might ask yourself, why would you even ask that? <laughs> but I ask that because I think that it's worth asking. Why? Why is it death? And I, as I was reading and as I was studying, I realized the first is that because God has the right to establish the law, and if he has the right to establish law, he has the right to establish its consequences. And I think that that is a hard principle for some people to accept because in a world where we are prideful and we want our own way, it is easy for us to look at an order and a way that God has created the world and say, I don't agree with that. I would do better. I think I can do better. I think that my 
understanding of law and its consequences is better. But it takes a very particular type of humility to look at ourselves and say, actually, I don't know better than God. And if God, as the one who established the law, has determined that sin and disobedience to the law is worthy of death, then because of my trust in God and in his wisdom, I can allow myself to humble myself and agree with that dynamic and what God has set forth. Second is that a great offense deserves a great punishment. It's easy for us to rank sin, for us to say that lying is just lying. It's not that bad. Why you make such a big deal? Or I was angry and I burst out in a rageful fit. Why is that such a big deal? For some reason, when somebody says, oh, I murdered someone, why is that such a big deal? Everyone's like, bruh, you murdered somebody. Nobody questions why murder is a big deal. Nobody questions why other crimes that we punish as a society are a big deal. But there are still, quote unquote, things we consider to be smaller sins that really aren't. We understand that all sin is equal before God. And that's as serious as that is, that's also to our benefit. It means that God doesn't look at us as a ranking system. He's not looking at who sinned a little better or who sinned a little worse from one person to the other. Sin is sin. And for us to be able to understand the gravity of sin, for it to be, in my opinion, and I think rightfully so, for it truly to be fair, if sin is sin, all sin is equal, then all sin would warrant the same punishment. Because then we'd get back into the ranking system. Oh, well, if you murdered, well, then you get like 10 years in hell. And that's, the, that's what you get. And then you can come back. It's cool. Same way like we do in our world. You know, you get this many amount of years in jail. Or you can get bail. You can get bonds. You can do all this stuff. God said, no. <laughs> Everything, all sin, is deserving of death. Why? Because all sin is a great offense to God's law. It is, our sin is not insignificant. It is serious. And that's important for us to understand. I know that's maybe a little bit of a downer, but that's the first step to dying to sin. It's the first step to choosing to walk away from sin is understanding that this is a big deal. The things that I do that are against God's will are a big deal. It's not just about me. It's not just about what I think is right or what I want to do. It's about how is this affecting the people around me, the world at large, and how is this being viewed by God? And God thinks it's a big deal. And in the same way, when we are coming to Jesus, when we are deciding to give our life to Jesus, that's the first step that we do is we admit that we're a a sinner and that this is a serious issue that we cannot overcome on our own. We need somebody who can take that punishment for us. And so we do have that somebody When Jesus died, he defeated sin and the power of sin over the world because he took the consequence in our place. When we die to sin, meaning to our own way, to our own will, to our disobedience, we share in Christ's victory over sin. Sin no longer has any power over us. We no longer have to live like we did before. Being dead to sin It's kind of like when somebody says, you're dead to me. We all know what that looks like. We all know what that means. Someone says, you're dead to me. They don't answer your calls. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to see you. If you're, man, this is awkward, but if you're in the same family and you guys go to like the same family event and they're there, they don't talk to you. They don't look at you. You go over and you're standing in line for like the buffet table at a wedding and they'll like literally go sit down or go to the other side, look for another buffet table, maybe go get the sweets early. Literally, do anything because you're dead to them. They want nothing to do with you. Get out of my life. Get out of my face. That's really terrible. We ought not to be that way towards people, but we ought to be that way towards sin. Sin, you are dead to me. I've done. I've walked away. I don't want to live like this anymore because sin is against God and When I make that decision to be for God, I don't want anything to do with anything that will take me away from him. And so it says further in Romans 6, 12 through 14, do not let sin control the way you live. 
Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And so that is one of the first symbolic acts of baptism, why we participate in baptism is to signify that when we are immersed, when we are submerged in the water and we are symbolically going into the grave, we are also showing that we are dead to our sin. We are walking away from that life. But what happens immediately after so that nobody drowns is the person pops right back up. Hopefully, I've seen some unfortunate incidences when people trip or like the pastor like kind of loses his grip or the person kind of like halfway submerges again and it's not a clean cut. That's all right. <laughs> the principle remains the same that ideally you go in dead to sin. You rise up a new life. And this last scripture that we read, it says that we, we rise up with Jesus. Jesus did not only die, he rose again. That sounds like a very simple statement, but it's very critical to our understanding of our faith and salvation. We always say, Jesus died for you, Jesus died for you. Yes, he did. But Kind of like the bigger news, the more miraculous part of that is Jesus rose again. He rose again so that you could have new life. Jesus had to rise again because otherwise he would have just been like any other person. We all die. Anybody can die. It's not that hard. Really low barrier to die. But Jesus rose again. And that was something only he could have done. And so it says in Romans 5 through 11, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Like I had mentioned, we want to have that same kind of attitude. Sin, you're dead to me. But we cannot have that attitude. We cannot actually live that kind of life if it were not for Jesus having defeated the power of sin in our life. And why defeating the power of sin over life? That is why we have the right to say, sin, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. It's because of what Jesus did. It's because through his resurrection, we have that authority. Because when we share in his death, we also share in his resurrection. And when we rise up out of the water, we symbolize a washing or cleansing of our old self. We symbolize that the old is gone and left behind in those waters. We have rised up and are ready to commit ourselves to follow Jesus. Our commitment means we don't live the way we used to. We don't speak the way we used to. We don't act, think, or treat others as if we were the same person that was living in sin. Through Jesus, we are given the power to resist our old ways, to die to our old selves, and live like Jesus. And the interesting thing about this particular act of baptism, different, I think, from many other steps that we take in our faith, is that it's done publicly, or traditionally it's done publicly. And I think that this is very important. I know that for some of us, there is a struggle and a hesitation to make public declarations of our faith. And I don't say that as a shameful thing. I say that as it's understandable because there's no telling how people will react. There's no telling what people will say. There's no telling what people will think. I think back to my own baptism. I had a moment of reflection recently to think about it. And I recalled how many of my friends from high school I invited to my baptism. And 
a couple of them came, and I was like, nice, <laughs> that's very cool. But I didn't have an opportunity to talk with them before I got baptized because I was already standing to go into the water. And then before, um, before, after I got baptized, they left because they told me that there was just too many people around me giving me flowers and everything. And when I texted them later and said, hey, like, I'm real, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate that. You know, like, where'd you go? What happened? And they said, oh, there's just too many people. It was just too crowded. And to kind of my regret is that I never really asked them how they felt. Like, what did you take away? <laughs> what did you think? Because these two people were not Christians. They were not believers in any sense of the word. But yet they came to my baptism. They witnessed me go into this water and I don't think at the time that we had English translation, so everything was in Ukrainian. So on top of this kind of strange action, it was in a language they did not understand. And, they, and I think about all of that together, and I think, my goodness. And I was out here inviting people left and right. I mean, I thought the, I thought the power of God was going to come down on them, and they'd repent right there. I still encourage you to have that kind of faith, you know, don't, don't doubt that that can happen. But at the time, that's not what happened. And one of my greatest takeaways from that point was that realizing that they were there and I was walking into that water, the most prominent thing that I can remember is the fact that they are there and that they're watching me. That this all makes sense to the people I grew up with in church. This is all the way that we do things. It's normal. Nobody bats an eye. But here are people watching me who have no idea what it is that's happening. Unfortunately, because everything was in Ukrainian, I do believe if it had been in English, maybe there would have been um, more of an impact. But still, sometimes we have to separate ourselves from the things that we think are strange about our faith and trust that God can do his work through it, even if it's strange to somebody on the outside. Maybe they didn't understand the language. Maybe they didn't understand the symbolism. But I find it hard to believe that they would forget having witnessed the act. And we as believers are called to have our light shine before men, to be a bright city on a hill. And we quote these scriptures and we treat them sometimes like cliches. But what's a practical way to do that? How do I really live like a city on a hill? How do I really let my light shine before men? Baptism is one of those opportunities to be bold, to be confident, to say, this is a stand I'm taking and I'm not ashamed. When we truly believe what Jesus has done for us, it is not really a challenge to publicly declare our allegiance and commitment to follow him. Besides having that testimony to those who might not be believers, doing it publicly before the church and other members of the church, we are now surrounded by witnesses. We are now surrounded by people who can hold us accountable. And not, again, hopefully, God willing, this is not what happens. This is not accountable in a judgment sense, like you're not living the way you're supposed to because I saw you get baptized and you're a sinner. That's not supposed to be like that. Having accountability in your life as a believer, being a member of a church and having that person who can come up beside you is exactly for that, that reason. They come up beside you. They're not coming down on you. <laughs> They're coming up beside you and saying, hey, I, I know what kind of decision you've made in your life. I know what you've chosen to do. I know that you are striving to follow after Jesus. And I can see that there are some things happening in your life right now that are coming against you and you need some support. You need some strength. You need some encouragement. And I, as a witness to your decision, as a member of the body of Christ, I'm going to come up beside you and support you. And, and maybe the most powerful reason for us to be willing and able to be baptized publicly is because Jesus died publicly. Jesus didn't go into a jail cell and be put on a cross where nobody could see him. Jesus had to walk the distance from the courts, from the temple to Golgotha where everyone could see him, where everyone could see him struggling where everybody could see him bleeding, where everybody could see him beat, where everybody could see him torn apart, where everybody could see the crown of thorns pressing into his forehead as the blood trickled down. Everybody could see the moment when he fell and could not carry the cross any further. 
Everybody could see when he was thrown down on the ground and the nails were beat into his hands and into his feet and he was raised up for everybody to watch him to die. And we know that there were people there watching him die. And they weren't just watching him die, they were mocking him as he died. They were spitting on him with both their physical spit and with their words. Utter disrespect, utter disregard, completely shameful. And he did that in front of everybody. Is it really so much for us to say that that's the person I follow? That I follow the Son of God who was willing to go through all of that so that I could go gently into the waters, <laughs> calm, beautiful lake waters, be slowly immersed, and then rise up again. Now that's a beautiful death and resurrection. But Jesus' wasn't like that. When we receive baptism, when we participate in this, we're saying, Jesus, I'm not ashamed of what you did for me. I'm not ashamed of how you died on a cross for me. I want to follow after you. I, wanna, I want the world to know that I'm following after you. And it's because you have risen again that I have been risen again to a new life. And when we do it publicly, that accountability is very critical. It's very important for us to live like we've been changed, to live like Jesus is in our heart, to live as if we believe in the one who died for us. That might mean that things that used to be funny to us aren't that funny. Jokes we used to make, things we used to talk about, stuff we used to watch, music we used to listen to, friends we used to have, all of that. All of that is a drastic change to follow after Jesus if it does not line up with his will. Like I had mentioned, we receive a certain degree of accountability because we are surrounded by witnesses who have seen us decide to follow after Jesus. And so the last, one of the, not the last, but one of the third things that occurs with baptism is that we are united to Christ and to the church, the church meaning the global church. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the name of or into the possession of God. In Matthew 28, 18, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our public act signifies that we have come under God's possession, under his authority. This part where it says baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, its, it's meaning means that we've, we've come under, we are under new management. You ever seen a salon come under new management? They have like a big reopening. You're like, I hope it's better. Sometimes it isn't. <laughs> But in the same way in our life, we've come under new management. Like I mentioned, we die to sin, we rise to life, we are united to Christ. Our public act signifies that we have come under God's possession, under his authority. Our old life, we lived for ourselves. Our new life is lived for Christ. We no longer live for ourselves. We represent Christ and his church, fellow believers. Understanding that we are under new management is really important to how we live our life once we've been baptized. Because you walk out of that moment and maybe if you've been baptized, you can recall it feeling like this, but you, you do feel the sensation of newness, of, of having gotten covered in this water, and then you walk out, and it's, you're like trying to get all the wet, the long dress out of the water, and you're being dragged down, but with every step, you just, you, you're just experiencing and almost reliving what had just happened, that this is it. I'm, I'm new. I'm, I'm baptized. When Jesus was baptized by John, he was led into the desert by the Spirit, and following this, he began his ministry. 
When it comes to being united with the church and when we start to, new our, to live our new life, unite with the church. When you are baptized, be ready to be tested and be ready to serve. This is why a big part of baptism is that you become a member of a church is because here's now the place where you can actively and practically live out the new life where you have people who are walking beside you who are saying, hey, I'm here to support you, and who up until this time have potentially been serving you by whatever means, whether it's the worship, whether it's from the stage by speaking, whether it's from the back by the different media or by the sound or by the kids' ministry, having Sunday school, so many things that occur, so many ways that we are served by the church. And then when we are baptized, we say, I'm living a new life and I'm ready to serve in the same way. We associate baptism with church membership because you are now part of a family that will walk beside you in your walk of faith. Just as the church has served you, you now serve the church. That's an important thing to remember about baptism is that almost, almost nothing that we do in our faith is for ourselves. Jesus himself said, I have not come to be served, I have come to serve. And if we want to live like Jesus, if we want to follow his example, then we have the same mentality. I'm here to serve. I've committed my life to Jesus now. And if Jesus served, if Jesus loved, if Jesus fed the multitudes, if Jesus healed, if Jesus prayed, if Jesus did this or that or the other, that's what I'm going to do now too. That's what I want to do. Dead to sin, raised to new life, united to Christ and the church. A few of the thoughts on, on the powerful, powerful symbolism of baptism and, and why we participate in it and why, and why we do it. And I do want to emphasize this again, that the only real prerequisite to baptism is receiving Jesus as your Savior. Sometimes we might convince ourselves that we need to know more about God. We need to know more about the church. We need to know more about this or that. And that's good to want to know these things. But we see that when people were baptized in scripture, the only real thing that happened for them to make that step for baptism was that they chose to believe that Jesus had died for them. And, it, and I do believe that it is still that simple that if we have the, um, the ABC of salvation, admit that you are a sinner, believe that Jesus died and rose again, confess him as Lord, ABC. If you believe that, if you are like, yep, I got it. I know I'm a sinner. I've sinned. I believe that Jesus died and rose again so that I can be forgiven of my sin. Got it. And I confess him as Lord, meaning that his way is now my way. And I want to follow after him. And so the next step comes naturally. I want to be baptized and let the whole world know that I've got it down. I've got the ABCs, easy as one, two, three. There is a weight and a gravity to baptism because it is a public act. You are making a declaration. And that's why it is a serious decision. It is something that you need to be sure of in yourself without a doubt that I am ready and I am willing to commit my life to following Jesus. And I want the whole world to know. We don't, you know, maybe very often talk about excommunication and, and people being removed from the church. But as far as I understand it, I won't go too deep into it, but as far as I understand it, that, that occurs when somebody who's been baptized and who's chosen to follow after God is egregiously and severely no longer living that life. And that's like repeat offense one after the other after the other. At least in our church, it's not something that's done lightly. It's not to freak you out. <laughs> I'm not trying to freak anybody out. I just, I just want to say that baptism is as easy as ABC one two three, but it has, it has a weight. It has an importance. It has substance. It isn't just walking in the water and getting dunked. But what I will end on is one of my favorite stories 
of one that we probably know, the Ethiopian man who was baptized by Philip. We know that the Ethiopian man was on his way to Jerusalem to worship. He had a scroll open. He was reading the law, the, what scripture was available at that time, which was likely just the first five books of the Bible. Um, that was probably what he had. I don't think any other writings would have been available, but I don't know. But Philip, one of the apostles, comes up beside him in his chariot, and he asks him, do you know what you're reading? And the Ethiopian man says, how can I if nobody explains it to me? And so Philip gets on up in the chariot, and as they're riding along, he begins to explain to him what he's reading. And what he's explaining to him is that he's essentially leading that man to repentance. He's leading that man to the understanding that Jesus died for him, that he resurrected, and that there is a new life. And after that has finished, they pass by a small pool of water, and the Ethiopian man says, what's stopping me from being baptized? And if I remember correctly, Philip essentially relayed what I just said and said, do you believe these things? And it's like, yeah, I do. And so then the Ethiopian man was baptized, and he went home praising God. And then Philip was taken away in the spirit. That question always stands out to me. It's such an obvious thing. What's stopping me from being baptized right now? If this is something that you have considered to do in your life, to take that step, what's stopping you? Because if you know Jesus, if you've repented and you've received him as your savior, and you're already in motion, you're already serving in the church, you're already following after him, and you're already sure that this is the life that you want to live, I really encourage you to consider for yourself the decision and have the boldness to get baptized this year. Don't, there, there's, we don't know what the future holds, but have some optimism. Have some confidence that if I choose to commit my life to Jesus, he's going to help me see this decision through. He's going to be by my side. He's going to honor this choice that I'm making. And I'm, I'm not going to be somebody who falls away. I'm not going to be somebody who slides back. Jesus is going to be with me, and I'm going to make it through to the end. I will run my race till the very end. Baptism is not necessary to being saved in the sense that we don't need to be baptized for to be saved, to have our name written in the book of life. Once we receive Jesus, that happens. But to receive that power and that and that presence of Jesus in our life as we serve and as we minister, to be like Jesus who went into the desert, was tempted and tried and came out on the other side, nice, and then began his ministry. It's not by accident that that's how those events happened, that that was the order, because you may be serving now, but there is a power and there is this oomph that is given when you become a member of the body of Christ through baptism and choose to make that declaration.